Hello and welcome to another episode of 10 Questions to MRCOG Mastery. The long-awaited RCOG Green Top Guideline update on recurrent miscarriage is here. Let's take a deep dive into it. As always, let's start with the basics. Question 1. How does the RCOG define recurrent miscarriage? Well, recurrent miscarriage is defined as three or more first trimester miscarriages. Two important points to note here. The first point is that the three or more miscarriages do not need to be consecutive. So if a woman has had a miscarriage, then she has a live birth. And after that, let's say she has two miscarriages, it would still be classified as a recurrent miscarriage as she's had three miscarriages in total. The second point to note is that the European ESHRAE guideline and the American ASRM guideline define recurrent miscarriage as two or more previous pregnancy losses. So the RCOG definition is somewhat stricter than the European and the American definition of recurrent miscarriage. Question two, what are the risk factors for recurrent miscarriage? We can group the risk factors into demographic risk factors, lifestyle risk factors, medical risk factors. Demographic risk factors include female age. Optimal age is 20 to 30, but both younger than 20 years of age and an age older than 30 both increase the risk of miscarriage. There is substantial increase in miscarriage after the age of 40. Interestingly, male age over the age of 40 is also associated with miscarriage. This is even after adjusting for the partner's age. Then we have BMI, lower and higher BMI, that is BMI less than 19 and BMI more than 25, are both associated with a higher risk of miscarriage. Black ethnicity is associated with miscarriage. We don't fully understand why, and that is a research priority, but we do know that black ethnicity is associated with a high risk of miscarriage. Okay, moving on to lifestyle risk factors. These include smoking, alcohol, excess caffeine, and shift work. Medical risk factors, you will know many of these include antiphospholipid syndrome, thyroid autoimmunity, subclinical hypothyroidism, polycystic ovary syndrome, DNA fragmentation in the sperm. These are all risk factors for miscarriage. Question three, what tests are recommended for couples with a history of recurrent miscarriage? There are five tests that you need to remember. The first is testing for antiphospholipid antibodies, that is lupus anticoagulant and anticardiolipin antibodies. The second is thyroid function test, so TSH, as well as testing for thyroid antibodies, TPO antibodies. The third is 3D ultrasound scan of the pelvis to look for congenital anomalies of the uterus, particularly uterine septum. The fourth test is cytogenetic analysis for those who are having their third or subsequent miscarriages, pregnancy tissues need to be sent for analysis to look for chromosomal problems, including aneuploidies and translocations. The fifth is that if there is unbalanced translocation in the pregnancy tissues, then the parents should be offered peripheral blood carrier type to look for balanced translocation. Question number four, what tests are not recommended as part of recurrent miscarriage workup? There are a number of tests for which evidence is limited or that they don't have any effective therapy and therefore there isn't much of a point in doing these tests. As the evidence emerges, the recommendations will need to be reconsidered, but for now, the following five sets of tests are not needed. The first is testing for inherited thrombophilia, that is for factor V Leiden, prothrombin gene mutation, 
protein C, S deficiency, and so on. They may have a role in mid-trimester pregnancy loss, but these tests are not recommended for early pregnancy loss. The second, immunological tests, such as HLA typing, cytokine levels, or natural killer cell testing, but these are not needed. They are not recommended because there isn't a lot that we can do to alter the outcome. The third lot of tests are testing for infections. So this is like torch screen. We used to do this in the past, but these are not needed. The fourth is testing for sperm DNA fragmentation. This is not really offered outside of research context. The fifth is testing for reproductive hormones, such as FSH, LH, estradiol, and progesterone. These are obviously relevant for infertility, but we are discussing recurrent miscarriage here, so they are not needed in this context. Question five, what lifestyle advice should you give to couples with recurrent miscarriage? There are five key lifestyle issues to address. The first is to achieve an optimal body mass index. The second is to stop smoking. And women should not be exposed to passive smoking either. The truth is, if the partner smokes, then the mother smokes. And if the mother smokes, then the baby smokes. And therefore, it is really important not to be exposed to smoking, even passive smoking. The third is to stop alcohol consumption. The fourth is to limit caffeine intake to less than 200 milligrams per day. The final recommendation is to consume a healthy, balanced diet, particularly enriched with fruits and vegetables. Let's now move on to treatment. Question six, how should you manage women with APS, antiphospholipid syndrome? First, remember you need to have two positive tests at least 12 weeks apart. If the results are discordant, a third should be done as the decided test before making a diagnosis of APS. If the patient has a diagnosis of APS, then the RCOG recommends aspirin and low molecular weight heparin from positive pregnancy test to 34 weeks of pregnancy. It's really important that if there is no thrombophilia, aspirin and heparin should not be given as that could potentially increase the risk of miscarriage. Question seven, how should you manage a woman with thyroid antibodies? No need for thyroxine treatment in women with thyroid antibodies. So we carried out a large trial called the TABLET trial that found that there was absolutely no increase in live birth rate in women with thyroid antibodies, but who are euthyroid, if they are given levothyroxine, it does not improve the outcomes. But women who've got thyroid antibodies should be tested in early pregnancy, say seven to nine weeks, to see if they have got any thyroid dysfunction, as women with thyroid antibodies are more likely to develop thyroid dysfunction in pregnancy. Question eight, how should you manage subclinical hypothyroidism? If TSH level is more than four milli international units per liter, thyroxine treatment can be considered. Now, many people would treat even very mild subclinical hypothyroidism, defined as TSH between 2.5 and 4, but there is no evidence to support treatment of such very mild subclinical hypothyroidism. Just like the women with thyroid antibodies, women with subclinical hypothyroidism should have their thyroid function test done in early pregnancy, around seven to nine weeks. Question nine, how should you manage if one of the parents has a balanced translocation? Genetic counseling is really important and they have the option following counseling to try again naturally. The risk that people worry about is the birth of a disabled baby with unbalanced translocation. But now we know that the risk of this happening is minuscule. So trying to conceive naturally is certainly an option. 
The second option for couples with balanced translocation is, of course, pre-implantation genetic testing, what we call PGTSR. But this should not be routinely offered as couples have a very good chance of conceiving naturally. So a highly invasive procedure like this should be carefully considered. Question number 10. How should you manage a woman with uterine septum? Observational studies showed benefit from septal resection, but the only randomized trial called the TRUST study didn't show any benefit. The study was small with only 80 randomized patients, but it is the only randomized study that we have. So the RCOG states resection of the uterine septum can be considered for women with recurrent miscarriage, but only within the context of appropriate audit or research. Okay, so that is 10 questions, but let me give you a bonus question. Question 11. When might progesterone treatment be useful? NICE guideline recommends progesterone for women who've had previous losses, any number of losses, one, two, three, it doesn't matter, and who are currently bleeding in the index pregnancy. In terms of asymptomatic patients, the RCOG guideline suggests that progesterone could be considered in women with recurrent miscarriage who aren't bleeding in early pregnancy. The treatment is with micronized vaginal progesterone, 400 milligrams twice daily, and given up to 16 weeks of gestation. So, that is 11 questions to MRCOG Mastery. Hope you benefited from this video. We look forward to seeing you in perhaps another future video or indeed at our intensive weekend MRCOG course. Have fun with your revision.